would think that winning a world title for your country would bring success, fame, fortune, and open endless doors of opportunity, right? Well, fame, yes. Fortune, maybe. As for opening doors of opportunity, it was more like opening Pandora's box. First of all, the expectations and promises of worldwide travel, solving the world's problems, and bridging cultures together was the first bubble that burst. The pageant organization had no budget or intentions to do any kind of meaningful social work or travel. The truth is, I won a prestigious world title. I could either sit around for a year silently, basking in self-indulgent thoughts of how great I was, or I could actually go out there and do something. During my final speech, I said the success of winning a title is based on how many people you can inspire, how many communities you can help. I have no idea how tangible those words would become for me. We all hear stories of how women are exploited in the entertainment industry. I had heard horror stories from friends who tried to get out of their agency's contract after constant sexual harassment and exploitation. But as terrible as their stories were, it was still something completely foreign to me. In the back of my mind, maybe I was thinking, well, you wanted to be famous, right? You chose to join those agencies. You should have known. Most people in Japan assume that a large part of entertainment industry is controlled by organized crime, and that women know what to expect in that environment. There is very little sympathy for women who complain about power harassment, sexual harassment, or rape. This is all the price they have to pay if they want to work. This was not going to be my legacy, the legacy of the first Japanese ever to carry the world title. I thought it would be a good idea to establish my own company and declare my complete independence and self-management. It was only at that time that I was informed that people around me, whom I had no obligation to, had already arranged to sell me to a shady agency with ties to organized crime. It was like, because I am a Japanese woman, they automatically claimed ownership over me. I never experienced this kind of violation of my privacy and basic human rights. Each time, I refused to sign away my rights to them. The pressure and intimidation increased. Until one day, after a live TV show, a man whom I never met before came into the TV studio demanding that he was my new manager. Terrified, I tried to escape to my dressing room, but before I could lock the door, he has already pushed his way into the room, grabbed my arm, and tried to abduct me. 
I was rescued by one of my staff, and the security was removing the man from the building. He kept saying the name of his company and thrusting his name card on the air, mumbling the name of his boss, the well-known leader of organized crime into the entertainment industry. Over the next 11 months, I experienced stalking, extortion, harassment, and business interruption. My family received phone calls and letters from him saying that he was worried I would wind up dead like another woman who refused him. I continued my mission to show the world what a Japanese woman can do for humanity. I visited hospitals and classrooms all over the world, connected children from other countries together, using Skype to facilitate lessons about cultural understanding and conflict resolution. I met female leaders in many countries, all at my own expense, all while living in fear. I kept my feeling of terror and helplessness quiet. I didn't want anyone to steal the national pride from the Japanese people that came with my win. I was determined to complete my reign and pass my crown to my successor together with a challenge to do more for women and humanity. The term stalking is relatively new to Japan. Until very recently, the legal definition of stalking as a crime required romantic involvement between the perpetrator and the victim. Unlike most industrialized countries, Japan has no real or immediate protection system for victims of stalking. When women go to the police for help, they're most often lectured and told to stop enticing their stalker. The next step is the police may choose to visit the stalker and ask them to kindly stop stalking the person who filed the complaint. This has too often resulted in the murder of the victim who went to the police for help. Only after there has been a real crime can the police then go after the stalker. After seeing on the news that several young women had been murdered by their stalker after being refused protection by the police, I began to research the very vague laws we have in Japan regarding stalking and how the victims are expected to provide extraordinary amounts of evidence before the police even consider investigating how the court system will not issue immediate restraining orders for victims and how our culture of silence toward crimes against women has become a culture of silence among its victims. How can victims cry out for help when they know they will be ignored, blamed, and abandoned by society, left helpless with no one to protect them from their tormentor? When I went to the police, one of the police interrogators actually suggested that I should simply give in and join my tormentor's agency. Can you imagine the police who are supposed to protect the victims wanting to deliver them to their tormentor? As murders of women started to become more newsworthy in Japan, I began to wonder how many women 
who are also being murdered by staged or forced suicide. For the first time, I began to sense the enormous scale of what is being covered up in our society. How completely alone and helpless we, as victims, feel we are. If a woman cries alone, with no one to hear, is she really crying? As a high-profile woman in Japan, I publicly exposed my tormentor and confessed the fear and pain caused by him. I asked people to sign their name and provide their personal information for a verifiable online public petition demanding new protection for women and victims of stalking. I went to bed that night in fear for my life and crying alone. But I have never felt alone again. For the next three weeks, thousands of women sent private messages to me, sent by women not only in Japan, but all over the world. I cried while I read their personal stories as if each were my own. I could feel their heart, their pain, and their fear. And they could feel mine. It was a global outpouring to all the women of Japan and to all the victims of stalking and domestic violence throughout the world. Letting us know that we are not alone. Their courage has become my courage. Their strength has become my strength. Through my voice comes the determination of countless others. We refuse to be the silent victims of a culture of silence toward crimes against women. A crime is a crime. If it's not defined by law, then we will change the law. We have a voice. We have a choice. Thank you very much.